All right. Question number one. Ready? Okay. Name the two contractile proteins. So when we look at the muscle tissue and we look at sliding filament theory, what are the two overarching, the thin and the thick filament? What are the two contractile proteins? number three is DOMS related to concentric or eccentric load and action of the muscle. Is DOMS related to a concentric or an eccentric load on the muscle? DOMS. DOMS. One, which are the two? Name the two contractile proteins. Question number two, which sensory receptor monitors stretch or length of the muscle? Question number three, is DOMS related to concentric or eccentric load action in the muscle. Okay. All right, make sure you've got, sorry? Which sensory receptor monitors stretch in the muscle? Change in length. Make sure you've got your name on there. Swap off. Contractile proteins, so a half a point for each, all right? Actin and myosin. So I, I am okay if they are spelled incorrectly, as long as they represent actin and myosin. They're the proteins within the fiber. Sensory receptor that monitors stretch on the muscle is the muscle spindle. Golden tendon organ me measures force. So muscle spindle or spindle. And number three is DOMS related to concentric or eccentric load and action in the muscle. Eccentric. It's the lengthening of the muscle that makes the muscle sore, not the shortening of the muscle. Alright, so total them up out of three for me. And Charlie will walk around and collect those while we're starting on the notes. 
and the attachment to the bone. So we see widespread adaptation within the muscle, but it's highly specific to what training I do. So that idea of training specificity when we're looking at this organizational unit is really important to pay attention to that. This diagram in your book, I think, is also a useful one to keep an eye on because it's, you're always trying to take the kind of abstract theory and make it make sense in an applied movement context. Okay? So when you look at this diagram, it gives you a very clear picture of the fact that the connective tissue and the muscle attachment to the bone is what makes me able to move my arm. Right? A skeleton can't move. The only way I can move my arm is by applying a force to the bone. Right? You remember your Newton's laws? The only way to move an object is to apply a force. Right? So if you take your lower arm as an object, the only way to move that is to apply a force to the bone. So this picture, I think, they do quite a nice job with this diagram of making that a really obvious link for you. All right? And then over here, we'll have another look at a similar picture on Wednesday. But this is a cross-sectional slice through the muscle, right? What I want you to pay attention to here is the fact that these myofibrils that make up a muscle fiber, right? There's lots and lots of, my of muscle fibers with myofibrils. So all the proteins are inside here. I've got a bundle of muscle fibers here. Here's the outside connective tissue. And then I've got lots of fasciculate to make one whole muscle. All right? And that picture is important because when we start looking at types of muscle fiber, I am not talking about types of muscle. I'm talking about types of muscle fibers that are within a muscle. And that can sometimes lead to some confusion for people. So keep that picture in mind, that cross-sectional picture there. All right. So what do we have to pay attention to when we're looking at those layers of connective tissue? All, right. All the different layers of connective tissue kind of pull together at the end of the muscle and become the tendon that attaches to the bone. And so that means that the connective tissue is responsible for transferring the force that the muscle can generate to the bone. That's why we see tendon injuries sometimes, right? Because the tendon may or may not be strong enough to deal with the amount of force the muscle can create. And so sometimes we see injury at the tendon level, the tendon ruptures. Sometimes the tendon's strong enough and the bone isn't strong enough. And so the force that is transmitted shatters the bone. Okay. There are instances of that occurring when you look at sports stories. Baseball throws, right? pictures, there's... Um, I can't remember his name now, but there was a quite famous uh, baseball pitcher a few years back who threw a pitch and his arm broke. Okay? Because the amount of force he generated, the bone wasn't strong enough to maintain that. Now there's a very good chance that there are some reasons for that, given it was baseball. I suspect he was um, taking something he maybe shouldn't have taken that weakened the bone possibly or at least allowed him to make the muscle so strong that the bone couldn't cope. Okay. 
but that can happen. So we want to keep thinking of the whole picture. Okay. This is a typo. Sorry, I should have caught this earlier. That should be the endomycium, not the epimycium. Okay. So the endomycium is wrapped around each muscle fiber and it prevents the spread of the electrical signal from the brain to the adjoining muscle fiber. If you go back to this picture, that will make sense when we start talking about fiber types. So the, the endomycium here around the fiber prevents any signal to that fiber contracting the next fiber to it. Each fiber has to have its own signal. Okay. That's important because I want to be able to control which fibers I turn on and off. I don't want to turn on a muscle that's good at doing aerobic work if I'm trying to jump a wall to escape from a raging dog. Right? That would be not very efficient of me. Right? So, and then another thing that the connective tissue plays a role in is the fact that it's relatively elastic. Right? It has some give in it. Right? And so the elastic component contributes to force and power production. So most of you were in lab yesterday and we had that conversation about what technique do I use to do a vertical jump? Right? Because if I step and bounce, I use a stretch shortening cycle. I use a stretch reflex within the measure of the vertical height I can achieve. Which isn't really what that particular measurement is about. So it's just like a rubber band, right? If I pull a rubber band really tight, it stores energy. And then when I let it go, it goes beep. The connective tissue is a similar, not quite as dramatic, but a similar situation. So this stretch shortening cycle then occurs when we have an eccentric action, so I lengthen the muscle under control, and then it's followed immediately by a concentric or shortening. If there's a gap, if I lengthen the muscle and I don't go straight away, the stretch shortening cycle doesn't ha happen. Right? It has to be stretch contraction straight away. Right? That means the timing of the stretch and contraction is really crucial within the skill. But it adds quite a significant amount of additional power and force production into that skill. Right? So I may or may not want to use that if I'm measuring a vertical. Depends why I'm measuring the vertical. Right? If what I want to know is how high can this person jump with any added benefit, I want to allow them to use the stretch shortening cycle. If I want to know how powerful are my fast twitch muscle fibers, I don't want them to use a stretch shortening cycle because that would be an inaccurate measure of power. So it just depends what it is you're trying to measure. When we do plyometrics, if you look at a plyometric program, plyometrics is developed to deliberately utilize this stretch shortening cycle. Right? And it trains improved force and improved power. So in a plyometric program, I might do those press-ups with a clap in the middle. Or I might be jumping down off a box and bouncing over another box. Does that make sense? 
So just be playing around when you're moving. Think about how often do I utilize that? If I am throwing, how often do we sat you? Know, like if you watch a baseball pitcher, they really, really, really exaggerate this. Am I right? Yeah. Yeah. right? They exaggerate this because this adds a stretch and adds more power to the ball. So that be eccentric? Eccentric? Stretch is eccentric. Contraction, shortening is concentric. If you look at page 80, there's a little box in there that gives you some information about the using stretching cautiously if you're a power athlete. Right? The research is a little muddled, but there's quite a lot of research out there that says if I'm going to do a power event, so if I'm going to jump or I'm going to throw, possibly even sprint, at least leaving the blocks, that maybe static stretching before I do that is not a good idea. Because there are some research studies that have shown that if we do static stretching, it interferes with power production. So they got these weird results and they're like, well, why would static stretching interfere with power production? And what they think is happening is that the stretch affects the connective tissue, right? You kind of reduce the elastic component of the connective tissue for a short period of time. So if I'm about to throw and I'm stretching out and then I throw straight away, the possibility is that the throw will be less than it could have been if you hadn't done the stretch immediately beforehand. So that has implications then about, well, when do I do my flexibility training? When do I stretch? Because we all should stretch. Right? So all we know right now is that that maybe should not be right before a power event. That's very interesting to me as an as a ex-gymnastics coach because we always did that. Right, just before you vault, if you watch the gymnasts, they'll all be standing at the end of the runway, stretching out their calves and their Achilles, or they'll be stretching out their hips, or they're putting on their chalk, they stretch all the time. And then they run down the vault runway and they land on their face the other side of the vault. <laughs> You're like, well, there's no, she must have been able to land that vault, otherwise she wouldn't be competing it. So what happened? So that might be one of the explanations as to what happened. Maybe. It's a really interesting line of research right now. All right, so here's my sarcomere, the smallest functional unit. So if you go back to the original picture, this is the sarcomere between that vertical wiggle and this vertical wiggle. The vertical wiggles are the Z-line, and you don't need to know, for me, you don't need to know every name of every space here, but the Z-line is quite important because when we start looking at contraction, the Z-line moves, and so we want to understand why the Z-line is moving, all right, what's going on there. Here's my thin filament, actin, and this is the key. The actin is attached at one end to the Z-line. Here's my thicker filament, the myosin, and you'll see there's some overlap between those two types of proteins. Right? Skeletal muscle is often called striated muscle because when you look at this under a microscope, muscle looks stripy, and the reason it looks stripy is because of these lines of actin and myosin in the muscle. 
So the sarcomere is where force production starts, okay? and it's capable of shortening because the actin and the myosin move across like this, and that drags the Z line in. So when we see contraction that is concentric, right, here's my actin, and here's my myosin. When we contract and we see the muscle shorten, then what we end up with is that. So we drag that Z line. So when I do a bicep curl, okay, watch the muscle as you do a bicep curl. The muscle actually shortens at the top of the curl. Right? And the shortening is occurring within the sarcomy. Okay? Following? You want to follow because otherwise next week starts to get tricky. Okay? So all this kind of anatomy side of it, like without understanding the anatomy, the structure, the physiology and what happens when we move doesn't make sense. Sarcomere shortens then, what's happening is that the active filaments are sliding over the myosin filaments and because they're attached to the Z-line, that drags the Z-line in with them. When the muscle relaxes and the sarcomere relaxes, then these proteins disengage and the force of gravity or a antagonist muscle will pull the Z line back out and they'll go back to their resting positions. Okay. So when they're at rest, there's less overlap between the two types of protein. And when they're contracted, there's more overlap. So I wouldn't have this space on the actin because the Z line would be all the way up here. look like. Right? The actin is often called the thin filament because literally when you look at it, it's thinner than the other one than I used. It's made up of actin molecules. Right? It's also got a tropomyosin molecule, which is the long kind of tubular type part of the molecule. And then we have a third portion that is the troponin. Right? So we call it actin, but in reality it's made up of three different things. Actin, tropomyosin, and troponin. I'm not concerned about the three different versions of troponin. Right? So if that helps you understand what's going on, then you're going <coughs> to look at those. But as far as I'm concerned, you can just stick with troponin and the role that troponin plays rather than break it down. So actin has an active site. It's an attachment point on it. And that's important because the thing that attaches to it is the thick filament so that we can get this crossover occurring. So the active site is on the active molecule and it's covered up when we're at rest by the troponin and the tropomyosin. 
So when we look at how contraction occurs next week, the first thing that has to happen is the active site has to become available. So we'll talk about that more next week. Okay. The myosin is the thick filament. And the myosin ha looks a bit like a tadpole or a sperm, right? It's got this globular head, and then it has a little hinge joint, and then a tail, all right? And so you get lots of this group together, the tails all intertwine, the heads all stick out, and we have a thick filament. So, again, next week this will make a lot of sense when we look at how the muscle contracts because that head is made up of ATPase. Now, when did we see ATPase in the last couple of weeks? What does ATPase do? It's an enzyme. It breaks off a phosphate, right? It doesn't break, it facilitates breaking down ATP into ADP to release energy for contraction, right? Well now, what we're saying is that head of that muscle is made of ATPase. So it's made of something that is very beneficial to re releasing energy for muscle contraction. Okay. So these heads stick out, they're called a cross bridge, because the head of the myosin, this cross bridge, is the thing that attaches to the active site, to the receptor site on the actin. So these sticking out form a cross bridge because the two molecules are now joined together. The thin filament and the thick filament. So then we're able to break down ATP, we release energy, and what we'll see next week is that this globular head, because it's on a hinge, can move, right? But now it's attached to the actin, so when it moves, it pulls the actin with it. And we see shortening. Okay. So review that a little bit before next Wednesday, because without that understanding of that structure, when we look at sliding filament theory, and I know you all covered sliding filament theory in biology, but we're going to do it again, because we never learn it the first time we see it, all right? Sliding filament theory will not make sense if you don't understand the structure. All right, so. Here's my muscle fiber. And I've got lots and lots and lots of muscle fibers and myofibers. If the muscle is designated as a type 1 fiber, those used to be called slow twitch fibers. So if you're looking at an old textbook or you're looking at an out of date website, then they may still call them slow twitch. But that is a pretty old classification system. If you look at this chapter, they give you a table of different classification systems. And they were called slow and fast twitch fibers when I was in school. <coughs> so that's pretty old. 
So a more up-to-date name classification would be a type 1. Type 1 fibers are relatively slow to reach their peak force production. So the point at which they're contracting them most strongly takes them a little bit of time relative to the other type of muscle fiber. And when they're contracting as hard as they can, they're not able to produce quite as much force as the other kind of fiber. Right? So if you look at this graph, here's my type 1. Right? It takes a little bit longer to get to its strongest, and its strongest isn't as high as a type 2. So that might lead you to think that type 1 fibers aren't very useful, right? They're too slow to produce any force. But they're really, really, really good at energy system number 3. They are very, very good at using oxygen to create ATP. Okay? For lots of reasons. One of which is they have tons more mitochondria than a type 2 fiber. And that's where, if you remember, where does type system 3 occur? In the mitochondria, right? So if I'm producing cars and I have more factories, I can produce more cars. Same here. If I have more mitochondria, I can produce more ATP. So they do that very, very, very well. That means that they are relatively fatigue resistant. They can contract over and over and over and over and over and over and over for a long time before they get tired. So that's very good. That means I can ride my bike for two hours or I can go hiking for four hours or I can sit in a chair for 50 minutes without falling on the floor and embarrassing the floor. Right? Mm -hmm. Okay? So they're very good at endurance type performance. Now, how much type 1 fiber do I have? Okay. That's pretty much determined by the time you're 1. When we're born, almost all our muscle fibers are either a type 1 or a type 2. We have a few, there's a small percentage that over the first year are still deciding whether they're going to be type 1 or type 2. So by the time I'm 1, I have X percentage of type 1s and Y percentage of type 2. Type 2 fibers then, used to be called fast twitch and they work a little bit, they work the same but what they're capable of doing is different from a type 1. They can contract very quickly. That means they're able to develop their peak force production in a very short amount of time and peak force production is quite a lot higher than it is for a type 1 fiber. So they can contract quickly and they can create more force. Right. Strength times speed equals power. So type 2 fibers are very good and very useful if I'm trying to do events that are powerful. Okay. They're not, however, very good at using oxygen. Some type 2 fibers can use some oxygen. They're not very good at it. Some type 2 fibers basically don't use oxygen. So that means that they get tired really quickly. They can't contract and contract and contract and contract and contract because they've only got a limited energy supply. 
I'm going to use system one or system two. That's short term. And now I'm done. Right? So they run out of steam very quickly. So great for jumping. Right? If I have to get away from yet another bleeding pit bull that some loony bin lets run around town without a lead on. Right? But not great if I'm trying to ride my bike to Roswell. Does that make sense? So when we're looking at these ratios then, it's quite an interesting picture because this ratio, how much fast twitch and how much slow twitch muscle I have, is basically genetically determined. It's not a trainable thing. I can train how big the muscle fiber is and therefore how good it is at its job, but I can't change it from being fast to being slow, or vice versa. So, on average, most me, most of us, not you because you're not average, right? most of us average people are somewhere around, uh oh, you can die, are somewhere around 50-50. So that means, can I run a mile and a half? Yes. Am I good at running a mile and a half? Not very. Can I do a long jump? Yes. Am I good at long jump? Absolutely no. Right? I'm average. I'm not good at anything. I'm okay at everything. If you look at an elite endurance runner, so if you look at a world-class marathon runner or 10,000 meter runner, then they could be anywhere from 70 to 85 percent. Let's go this way, real. Right? 70 to 80. Oh my God! I'm sorry, I said endurance, didn't I? <laughs> They could be anywhere from 70 to 85, which means this side is 15 to 30. That is not typical. That is not normal. That is not average. They are really good at marathons and 10,000 meter because physiologically they can be. This person cannot run a marathon in two hours and 15 minutes. Right? If I look at the other end of the spectrum and we look at an elite sprinter, then we're looking at 65 to 70% type twos. So we're looking at 30 to 35% type ones. Not normal, not average. Can my marathon runner sprint? You ever seen the end of a marathon race? Oh yeah, they can sprint. Can they win a 100 meter race? No. Can my 100 meter runner run a marathon and raise money for a charity? Yes. Are they gonna run the marathon in two and a half hours? No. That's important because we spend a lot of time telling our children you can do whatever you want. You can be anything you want to be. All you've got to do is work hard enough for it. Okay? And that, when you're working in a movement field, is just not true. And it leads to a lot of disappointment because people set unrealistic goals. You would not tell someone who was four foot five that they could be on the Olympic basketball team, would you? Would you? Any of you? No. Why? Why not? That's just not realistic. Oh, sorry. Right? Four foot five. 
That is not going to play basketball. Right? And yet, we do tell people, it's okay. If you want to run a marathon in under three hours, all you have to do is train hard enough. No. Some people will never run a marathon in under three hours. It doesn't matter how hard they train. Because it depends on this. And I don't get to control this. It's genetic. I'm born with it. I can't change it. I am what I am. I am slow, I am fast, I am average, whatever it is. All I can do is maximize what I have. And that's where training comes in. I can maximize what I've got. Yes, sir. So, so you're basically saying that right, the, like, right from the moment we're born, we're, we're destined to be athletes or not, basically, then? Uh, I'm not sure I would use the term destined. I would use the term potential. So, Do you have the potential to be an athlete or not? Yes. We all know there's more to being an athlete and to winning than just what our body is. Okay? I can have the most amazing physiology on the planet and not be an elite athlete because I can't be up. I don't want to work that hard or I expect to win because I know I'm good so I can't, I'm not, I don't have to train, whatever, right? Or my parents are really, really poor and the closest gymnasium is 50 miles away and they can't get me there. So it doesn't matter how good I am, if I can't train with someone who's knowledgeable, I'm not going to win. Right? There are lots and lots and lots of things involved in winning, but it doesn't matter what you have. If you don't have this, you're not likely to be very good. Right? Okay. Quite finished totaling all of them. 